So there's a uh, two problems left that I want to talk about in chapter 11. Uh, one is in the textbook, one is not. So the, the first one is problem 66 in the textbook. Uh, it is a red problem, but I don't really know why, uh, because it is not that bad. So what happens in this problem, it's just weird, okay? What happens in this problem is that we have a table, and on the edge of the table, we have an infinitesimally small little lip, right? Then we have a cube, and I'm only showing, uh, obviously, a side view there. A cube whose height is much larger than this little lip. And the cube is of side 2a. Why 2a and not just a? I don't know, just run with it. Uh, um, just it makes some geometry things easier in their minds, right? And this cube's center of mass exists, or rather, obviously, the center of mass exists, but the center of mass is the center of it because it's a uniform cube, and its uh, velocity is such that it's whatever, it's moving towards the little lip. So what's going to happen here is that when it hits the lip, think of it almost like tripping. If someone's walking along and their foot hits um, some sort of curb, but their body, their center of mass, has inertia and a velocity, that means that person is going to tip over, right? And that's what's going to happen here. That this um, box is going to slide here, hit there, this becomes a fixed point, and then the uh, cube is going to tip up. The question is, because remember this is a table, how fast does it have to be going until it tips over, right? So it tips upwards. I'm just going to draw this in three little uh, uh, vignettes here. So uh, there'll be a, a time when it just hits here and it just starts tipping, right? So this is when it just starts tipping. It has an omega in this direction. No longer does it have a velocity of center of mass because of this obstruction. Well, actually, the center of mass does have a velocity, excuse me, but it's no longer traveling linear. What's more important here is not the velocity of the center of mass, but now it is the um, omega of the object. And then at some point, it's going to get to the point where it can tip. And we know that that tipping condition occurs in the previous unit um, that it needs to get such the center of mass is directly over that pivot. If this omega is enough to get it to this position minimally, then it will uh, either get into an unstable equilibrium here and then just balance, which would be freaky, or it would have any omega left and therefore tip over the edge. So this is sort of like my initial situation A, and this is B, and this is C. So we ask the question, well, what's happening from A to B? and then B to C. Well, although it may not be obvious, from A to B is a conservation of angular momentum problem. How do I know that? Well, I have a linear object that ends up going into rotational motion. That always, to me, screams, think about conservation of angular momentum. Now, you may say, but hold on a second, um, this thing, uh, ex this thing experiences a net external torque. And the answer is no, it doesn't because this is the pivot point. So the torque that's happening here in the initial uh, transition from the linear to the um, rotational motion uh, is happening because there's no torque, right? Or no, uh, rather, the, the, excuse me, the torque through the pivot here doesn't, doesn't do anything, rather. The, there's no net external torque. But then from B to C, as it begins going up, this is a conservation of energy problem because gravity is a net external torque here. So the logic of this problem is we need to know at point B, what is the angular velocity immediately after it begins its upwards motion? And then point C here is I want to figure out the minimum VCOM that gets it to this point. So at this point, we're going to assume that the, um, that the omega goes to zero at that point, so that this thing just gets to that point, right? So that's what we are going to look at for this problem, this uh, combined angular uh, momentum tipping problem. So I'm going to take this now. I'm going to draw it in one sequence across just so we can see. 
So I've got this, vcom, right? It just starts tipping, so I'm going to draw it pretty much flat here, and that's our omega at B, and then draw it again when it's at its tipping point here, okay? And the reason why I want to do that is because I want to do a UG is equal to zero line here, okay? So situation A, situation B, situation C. So we said that going from A to B is an angular momentum problem. And most tipping things, it's like in the instant that it goes from its linear motion to that rotational tipping motion, that's the instant of the interaction we're talking about. Not the whole thing, just that one moment. So why does this thing have angular momentum initially? Well, this object has angular momentum because of its initial, its initial linear motion. Because remember we said the pivot point was there. So this picks up a term of mv times what is the height of the center of mass above the ground. Now remember, I said that this was of side 2a. Here's why they did that. Um, that means that this has a, well actually let's do some declarations for the angular momentum. I know it's going to start moving counterclockwise and I know that that's positive because that those two things are linked to each other. So this has a positive, or clockwise, excuse me, positive uh, mass of the thing initial velocity of the center of mass, so let's call that vi, so v, v comma is vi, and then a, because that's half the height here. That's the line of action of the center of mass above that pivot is that. Then is equal to i of whatever a cube about an edge is. We'll talk about that in a second. So i b omega b. So cube about its edge. Well, we said before, just to do this argument, here's a disk. A disk has one half mr squared, but that's also a cylinder, one half mr squared. It really doesn't matter like what the depth of it is if I'm going about its center of mass because you know if you have a cylinder that's just the, the mass here and the mass here are the same distance from the axis of rotation. So it doesn't actually matter what the depth of it is. All the depth of it is is going to, based on the density of the object, increase the mass of it. So in the same way, a disk is the same thing as a rectangle. And we proved in an earlier video that the moment of inertia of a rectangle about an axis through its center of mass is 1 12th uh, if one side is A and the other side is B, A squared uh, plus B squared. So here I have a cube. So that same logic is going, actually let me not use A and B, uh, I'll use L and W because that'll get confusing in a second because of this problem, right? Um, L and W here are both uh, the same and they're both 2A. So what does that make us? 1 12th, 2A quantity squared plus 2A quantity squared, right? And so uh, what does that give us in terms of this? Um, so I've got uh, 4A squared plus 4A squared um, and, uh, da, 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 and, um, uh, so that is 8a squared, uh, and then 1 12th. Hold on a second. Something is not working here because the answer I'm, <laughs> the answer I'm going for here is 8 thirds m a squared. This is the moment of inertia. Oh, got it. Right. This is the moment of inertia about a cube about its edge. So this is a, the moment of inertia of a cube about its center, and that gives us um, eight uh, a squared over twelve, which is um, oh, there's an m term there as well. Sorry, m um, m um, m. Great. So which is uh, two uh, thirds m a squared. But that's about its center of mass. We are rotating at about this edge point there. So that means this is A and this is A. So the shifting factor here is rad 2A. So uh, a cube about its edge, 2 thirds MA squared, which is a cube about its center. Hold on to that. So this is a cube of side 2A about its center, 2 thirds MA squared, uh, plus uh, M for the shifting factor, and then um, rad uh, 2A squared. Uh, so that gives us 2 thirds ma squared plus 
2MA squared. Uh, to get this into thirds, that's 6 thirds MA squared, or going back to what we know the answer is, I of a cube about its edge is equal to um, 8 thirds MA squared. Uh, omega final. In my mind, that's actually the hard part of the problem. And the problem 66 actually gives you that piece of information. So I just wanted to derive from you from earlier principles why a cube about its edge um, is equal to that. So there we go. So that's not omega final. Let's call that omega b because that's its omega just as it's beginning its, uh, its trip upwards. So a, a, uh, m's, m's. So Omega at point B is apparently uh, 3 eighths VI over A. Great. And so then uh, as we go energy, energy at B is equal to energy at C. But we're going to say energy at C is going to be, if I want the minimum, technically what this should be is, well, at B, it's rotating about its edge. So this should be KER at point B is equal to uh, UG at point B, because notice I've made where the center of mass of this is object initially where uh, UG is equal to zero, uh, plus KER at, uh, this is actually C, C plus KE, actually no, it's rotating about its edge, there's no, uh, and it's constrained here, so we don't say that this has a center of mass um, translational term. But we're gonna take the limit such that omega at c goes to zero to find just that tipping point. So here we go. We've got one half and then i, which is uh, 8 thirds ma squared, um, omega at b, which we know is 3 eighths vi over a quantity squared. That's going to get a lot of canceling. Is equal to mg y at c, damn it, going to have to do some geometry, uh, plus zero. So let's do that geometry. How far has that moved up? Well, I know that this is A above, and uh, in this analysis here, how far is the center of mass from that? We know that that's red 2A. Okay, Y at C apparently is uh, rad 2A minus A. Okay, so then I'm just gonna go to a clean piece of paper here to get that. I've got one half, 8 thirds ma squared, and then 3 squared, 8 squared, vi squared, a squared, just to make that a little bit neater for canceling, is equal to mg, um, and then I'm going to pull out the a there, a times rad 2 minus 1. Boom. So let's just go through a cancel fest here. Um, I've got a 3 and a 3, an 8 and an 8. I've got an M and an M, I've got an A squared, and I've got an A squared, uh, and that looks like just about it. Remember, I'm trying to solve for VI, so let's start moving things over to this side. I've got, um, I've got eight and two, that's 16, so I've got a 16 GA radical two minus one, right? And then in uh, the denominator, it looks like I'm gonna have a three. Oh, and that's it. And then VI, so square root, plus or minus, get rid of the minus because I'm looking for the speed, and there we go. And so that's what we have. And so uh, it looks like the, the larger the object is, the faster it has to go. That makes more sense because the object then, if it is uh, a, a, a larger object, it has to gain more potential energy until the center of mass is over the pivot. And the rest of these terms come from the specific geometry of what we're trying to, to tip. Uh, so there you go. That is the tipping problem. I love that problem. It's a great problem. Uh, you'll see something similar to that soon enough. Uh, another tipping problem, which is just like a classic physics problem that most uh, college lecturers spend a full day on, or at least half a day on, and so I think it's worth talking. Let's say I have an object that's rolling, and we'll say it's rolling without slipping to make the, uh, the this easier at first. And I could do this when it's slipping, but let's not. Um, let's say that I have the object rolling along with slipping, and let's say it has initial velocity, VCOM, and then it's concomitant omega initial here, and then obviously because it's rolling with slipping, we know that VCOM initial 
is equal to omega initial times r. Now, whether that's a disk, a hoop, or whatnot, I don't know. Uh, we'll just keep that into uh, a normal, it's gonna be some sort of rolling object. So it's i is gonna be some sort of q m r squared, where r is the outside um, uh, radius, and q is some factor like one for a hoop, half for a disk, two fifths for a, hollow, uh, for, a for a solid sphere, but just to keep it general. Now, when this thing hits the step, what happens here is, depending upon certain geometries, that thing could actually climb up the step. And you've probably seen that a rolling object sort of like rotates up onto the step. And so our question is, what's got to be true for this thing to rotate up onto the step? Well, there's a lot of similar similarities between this problem and the previous problem. In the last problem, our, our obstruction didn't really have a height, but now we're dealing with it having a height, right? And the reason why the previous problem was able to get up over that ledge is because it had angular momentum due to the linear motion of this. Now here's the difference. Rather than this being the, the pivot that matters now, this is the pivot that matters. So let's talk about why this thing has angular momentum. Well, depending on where the line of action of this initial velocity is with respect to this point, this thing could have angular momentum with respect to this point. So what would be that term, that lever arm term? Well, that lever arm term there between the, the, the axis of rotation and this would be the outer radius of the object minus the height of the ledge, right? Now notice here, if I call this direction positive, clockwise is positive, because we know this thing is gonna to wanna to tilt clockwise on. If the center of mass is above this point, right, that this term would produce a positive angular momentum, which would help it turn up. If this was below that, it would produce a negative and would not help it. But why else does this thing have angular momentum? Well, very clearly, because it is rotating, all right? So that's what we've got here. And then the second half of the problem about it tipping upwards is we need it to get to the top here. So we need it minimally to get the center of mass to go up a distance of h, right? So there we go. That's the parameters of the problem. So it's the same three steps as before. A and then B is just as when it hits that it begins to start rotating upwards. And then C is when it comes to rest here. And so the questions are, what's got to be true about H to allow it to get up to the top? All right, so we're going to actually work this problem backwards, okay? So we'll work this problem from C back to, to A. So first, we'll be doing a conservation of energy as it starts to rotate up to this point. Um, work non-conservative is equal to zero because the only thing that's doing work here is gravity. So at point C, we know at that limiting uh, point, all it has is UG, right? Um, that's all we care about. Technically, this thing would have, when it gets up to the top here, both a KER term uh, and a KET. So why does this one have a KET when it gets up to the top but the last one didn't? Well, if this thing is still spinning when it gets up to the top, it's gonna go back into rolling motion. And so it has both a, trans the center of mass has both a translational and a rotational point. It's only constrained while it's trying to get over the edge Whereas in our last problem, the thing was constrained the entire time. Now those two terms are about to go to zero. And this is equal to Ke of the rotation of the object right at B when it begins rotating about this point. So if I take the limit there just to get rid of this as omega at C goes to zero, right? Both those terms go away and I get MGH, which is the height of the step, is equal to one half i. Now, what's the i here? We'll talk about that in a second. So the i here is not this i because that's the i of the center of mass of this object. So this has got to be uh, i com plus um, the shifting term. And so what's the shifting term? That's rotating about its edge, m r squared, right? So there we go. So first thing we're gonna see is that the mass is cancel. So that's kind of nice there. Uh, so let's now move some things around to find what omega b uh, squared is equal to. Omega b squared is 2gh over um, 
r squared and then q plus 1. So the q plus 1 is depending upon what type of object it is. If it's a hoop, q is 1 and the 2's cancel. If it's a disk, q is a half and then uh, 2 over 3 halves, you know, it, it just changes. Okay, so that means omega at point b is equal to the square root of 2gh over r squared q plus 1. Usually when they do this, they just assume it's a hoop to make the math easier. I like this expression because it, it shows us that things change based on the shape of the object. Now, here's the fun part about this problem. LA is equal to LB because the net external torque is equal to zero. Once again, same argument as before. So initially, what type of angular momentum does this have? Well, the object initially has two angular momentum terms. It has an I omega term, right? Uh, and this is about its center of mass. So this is due to just the rotation of the object and its initial velocity going along. And then it's gonna have an MVR term. So an MV, well, MVL perpendicular term. But this L perpendicular term is R minus H. Now notice I did not impose directionality here because I kind of did it internally here. As I argued before, as long as the center of mass is above the height of the thing, that that is going to produce a positive uh, clockwise angular momentum. And if h is taller, that produces a negative, uh, and that deals with that sign there. Obviously, we're plugging in something for omega. If it has uh, whatever the initial um, uh, term is there, that's what it is. And so that's going to equal then i about the edge, so about this, times omega b. And so now let's expand that a little bit. I'm, I didn't leave myself a lot of room here for expansion, um, but I think I have enough room to do this in two lines. So i com, so that's just going to be qmr squared uh, omega at position a. And then plus um, mv that minus that. Um, and then equals this about the edge. We've already said that that's going to be mr squared times q plus 1, right? And then omega b, which is the square root of 2gh over r squared q plus 1. And this thing just looks like a disaster, but it is not as much of a disaster as you may fear because Let's do a couple of things here, canceling. First off, all the m's are gonna go away, right? So that's easy. Next thing up, we can change uh, some of these terms. Notice I have an r squared in the denominator here under the radical, and I have an r squared here. So in other words, both of these r squareds, if I pull an r out, get rid of that one, okay? Kind of similarly here, uh, I can play with this. I have a q plus one to the first, and denominator-wise, I have a q plus 1, uh, and that's the 1 half. So I can actually change up what's going on here. So let's do that. The other thing is, um, if we talk about the center of mass here, there's a linkage between these two because I've got pure rolling, right? So in this case, if they were not in pure rolling, that's how I would deal with the problem. There'd be no linkage. Here I said there was a linkage, so we're going to use that linkage now. So I have q r squared. And then omega is equal to v com over r plus, uh, or, or va, we called it, va r minus h. And then on this side, it looks like uh, what's happening is that I can have r times the square root of 2gh q plus 1, right? Uh, I left the r on the outside. Uh, because I wanted to play with that, and then I have the uh, the q plus 1 brought in here becomes q plus 1 squared, and that would get rid of that. I just do that because I like getting rid of denominators. Speaking of getting rid of denominators, boom and boom, right? So now, let's sort of write out neatly what I have. Because, by the way, the question is, does it get up the step? And so we're going to look at different parameters. Plus, uh, actually, I keep calling it Vcom Va, and we know that's the velocity of the center of mass. I've got here Va r minus h, which is a great term, is equal to r square root of 
um, 2GH Q plus 1. Okay, so uh, what can I do with that? Well, let's divide through by R. So I've got, um, oh, and I can actually, yeah, let's, let's divide through by R and see what we get here. Uh, I get QVA plus um, VA R minus H equals square root of 2GH Q plus 1. Okay, and so now I can say, well, what is the minimum velocity that gets me up over that lip? I've got this term here, all right? Um, I've got radical 2GH Q plus 1 over, uh, it looks like, Q plus R uh, minus H, right? Once I factor out the VA from there. All right, so I'm just gonna keep this term like that. All right, so what does that do for us? What does that tell us? Okay, well, what can we extrapolate from that? Well, notice here that if I have, for example, a hoop, Q is one. Let's see what that does to my expression. VA is equal to 2GH times two, all over one plus R minus H, okay? So what's gotta be true in order for this to work? Well, I need this denominator here, right, to not be negative or zero. The second this denominator is zero, this thing blows up to infinity and I would need an infinite velocity to make that happen. So one plus r uh, minus h has gotta be greater than zero. So what's true about h? Well, um, h needs to be less than r plus one for a hoop to get up over uh, that hill, okay? Obviously that condition would be different for a disk, it would be different for a sphere, but there you go. I can use this analysis in order to figure out what that minimum velocity needs to be in that context out of that. So the hard part here was getting it down to an expression for this minimum velocity and then creating the physics question, right? So what velocity is needed is not really the right question. It's like, what has to be true about this such that this doesn't explode into um, um, numbers that don't make sense? So there you go. That's the tipping of the, uh, the, the hoop disc or cylinder around a uh, 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 an edge, and it's just an application of conservation of energy and conservation of angular momentum.